Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime. From the Apostrophe Podcast Network. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. The highway of love and relationships is littered with broken hearts due to one person's ambition and interests coming up against the other's lack of comprehension of what it takes for an artist to succeed, or at least the lack of agreement to be part of that. Certainly in my case, my desire to achieve something more in life, to try to do something that matters, had a big role to play in my own relationship enders. For my friend, comedian, and now author, Ron James, it was much the same. Scratch beneath the surface of any funny man or woman, and you will find heartache and heartbreak. They're no different than you. In this part two of my chat with Ron, we go a little deeper into his personal life and his drive to matter. For people like Ron and myself, mattering is existence. You're joining us mid-conversation where we're talking about, or rather maybe trashing, network executives, primarily Canadian TV execs, as well as Ronnie's failed attempt at making it big in Hollywood. To set the stage, we were sitting just up from the lake in a couple of Muskoka, also known as Adirondack chairs, with a fine scotch and the wind on the microphones. And a warning here, there is the odd F-bomb. Ron has just come out with an incredible new book called All Over the Map, Rambles and Ruminations from the Canadian Road. Do yourself a favor and pick it up. These are the words of Ron James. Uh, I was getting standing ovations, and she was getting loads of laundry. There were fat caterpillars and ladybugs, and all them things you'll find underneath your rugs. Because, you know, we're only 20 years away from wearing our Led Zeppelin onesies, wandering the home a Sing along away from taking a stairway to heaven. Hairy black spiders you'll be scared to approach, but they were nothing compared to that rotten cockroach. We want to get this guy Ronnie James in. Yeah, what's he what's he good at? He's good at X. Really? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's get bring Ronnie James in, and he's gonna be good at X. Okay, here we go. Let's launch X. Oh, we don't want you to do X though. We want you to do uh, Y instead. But you brought me here to do X. I mean, it's in the contract. Oh, well, now you're being an asshole. Buddy, that's exactly it, Les. They hire you to be you. And then they don't. But then when you're doing it, they don't want you to be you. That's why I was able to channel my life force and my creative so cohesively and with clarity in my specials, Hmm. in my stand-up act. And because no one was trying to get me to be anything other than what I did. And the road was everything. If I can get back to coming back to Canada. So coming back from Los Angeles, yeah. I mean, we were in debt. We had to start over. I wasn't in the townhouse community anymore with all the different pools and the tennis courts and the places to... So we had another uh, another child. First daughter's name is Kaylee. She's 32 now. My youngest uh, is Gracie. She's 27. I wanted to put those three years in perspective. I had to. I remember June, my wife, saying, look, when we go back to Canada, it can't be the same as it's always been. You can't just sit around and wait for your agent to phone. She said that. She sure did. And I have to give her credit because she deserves so much. And That's very intuitive. Oh, well, she was smart, man. And she said, you have to take charge of this yourself. Hmm. And I just don't think that being a comedian is what she planned. Uh, I was getting standing ovations, and she was getting loads of laundry. Mm. 
and we just moved apart and the road was hard to shake. I mean, you're a warrior on the road. You're going from gig to gig to gig to gig. Your milieu is the stage. You're working on that. All systems go and you're did, nocturnal. Did she understand the passion in your soul for what you were doing? I, mean, I don't think so. Understanding is different from accepting it. But, I know. don't think so. Hmm. After five years at the Laugh Resort, uh, which was a great little club in Toronto, which was right down the street from where I started at Second City. Mm. So it'd come full circle. But to find stand-up and to start Amateur Night again, after I wrote Up and Down in Shaky Town, One Man's Journey Through the California Dream. Wow. So I wrote that when I came home. I put it up at Factory Theater in 93. No, 94. In the summer of 94, I started Amateur Night again. I had to start over again. You're, what you're describing, I will tell you, I, massive admiration for me, oh. on which, and I'll tell you why. I've always been in love with the stories of creators that do hit bottom, that do have to start again. I think many people would be quite shocked and surprised at how many there are. Randy Bachman, you know, in between Good man. the Guess Who, massive rock band, right? And BTO, also massive rock band. In between those two gigs of Randy Bachman's, he had his new members of his new band, Bachman Turner Overdrive, sleeping in tents in a park outside of Vancouver to save money so they could play some gigs because okay. they couldn't afford. And he's already been in the Guess Who for however many years. Eight number one hits on right. American Billboard. And now he's he's got his new band sleeping in tents to save money. And what? to me, I always thought, you see, look at that dedication. He could have He could have put his feet up and said, you know... Well, guess who imploded? And I'm just I'm sick of this business. And he could have done anything. No, no, we're gonna let's go. And the band is, and, that, and then he went on to. It's be, because BTO. playing music defines his life and his life purpose. And so is being funny, define your life and your life's purpose. It does. It does. Uh, I. I uh, there's no greater joy I get than watching people laugh. Yeah, I kind of broke my heart, you know, when I saw my hero in Vegas, George Carlin six years before he died at Harrods. I was down there doing a corporate gig and paid 75 bucks for a ticket at Harrods and there were 2,500 people there. And he talked for 90 minutes and didn't get a laugh and he didn't care. And that's when he said he'd found his authentic voice. And I thought, but if I didn't hear laughs every 30 seconds, I'd commit Harry Carey as a closer. I mean, I have to hear it because that's the purpose. And this is, this is the holy note of the work and you must find it with your music too is the symbiotic relationship between performer and audience. And with stand-up, this is one of the <laughs> tragedies of COVID for live performers in stand-up, is that, you know, a guy on a stage doing a set is a comedian. A guy on a stage at home is uh, a lunatic talking to the four walls. Mm. And which is why I streamed a couple shows from the living room and such uh, during, during COVID, because that... That relationship is lost. Not being able to hear laughter when you're performing at home during COVID. I mean, it's like I'm in a space capsule orbiting the Nebulon galaxy, sending dispatches back to fellow Earthlings. It's like, okay, I guess they're hearing it. But, <laughs> uh, however, to finally leave the laugh resort after that thing, we were talking about these different tipping points, how the circles open and close. And so the place was going down and uh, they were selling the building. It's a condo now, right? I still wasn't making enough. I had to feed my family, which is why I got into stand-up too. I said, I got tired of waiting for somebody else to feed my family as an actor. So I became a comedian and fed them myself. I'm delighted to say I haven't had an agent in 25 years almost. And I started booking myself from my house. And uh, we were in this little semi-detached in Toronto's beaches, uh, which was uh, my first house at the age of 38 borrowed some money from dad, not much, 5K to put a down payment. In those days, I got it for 200 and I think it was 210,000 bucks and ended up doing a lot of the renos myself until I started hitting the road and I started booking myself. And nobody wanted to touch stand up in those days. They'd say, oh, we had comedians come through when they were filthy. I said to them, well, listen, if you hear a band and you don't like their tunes, does that mean you don't like music anymore? So I had to sell myself hard. I remember we'd get a gig uh, or something like that, and they'd say, okay, you come down. You can do up and down in Shaky Town. I snuck in the back door with the one-man show because they thought it was a play because it wasn't stand-up. Had lighting cues, a beginning, middle, and an end about my three years in L.A., and it was, you know, had Canadian content. It was a Canadian fish out of water chasing the Los Angeles dream, and he comes back home to where he belongs, to where everything feels familiar. Then I took the best bits out of that 
and went to the Laugh Resort as stand-up. And it felt much different than when I tried it 15 years prior. I was ready now. Mm. And it's what Joseph Campbell says. You have to follow your bliss. But, and everybody has a different inciting incident. But my tipping point was not getting what I went for in Los Angeles. And not, you know, nobody, uh, so few do. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. we'll hear about Joe Rogan making 110 million bucks as Spotify, or his podcast, or you just hear the stories. And nobody wants to hear about struggle. That's the metal that made you. I mean, that's that's where my people are from. My mother's from the Coal Town Road. I mean, my father's from a pimple of granite in Newfoundland. And and uh, the friends that I had, they they weren't from privilege. They were just people who went through life putting one foot in front of the other, trying to make the best of it and work with what they've been given, which was the great quote from the Bob Dylan book I listened to on the road, Chronicles, which I love. And uh, I like Keith Richards' book, too. And Steve Martin's, of course. There's, uh, I listened I've, to a few of them. I've, I've got all three. I've, oh. I read them. I actually read the paper. Have the paper version. How about that Steve <laughs> Martin quote when he's done Johnny Carson? He did Johnny Carson 14 times. Yeah. And the 11th time, Johnny leans into him and says... You'll use everything you ever knew. And that's the profundity of the work is where we're drawing from and what we're trying to, what tools we're utilizing in order to drive the art form. But there's a great deal of condescension in Canada about the art form of stand-up. You feel it because they don't know what to do with you. They, they have no clue. And, and I used to say to my agent when I was at the Laugh Resort, look, why don't you send these producers and directors down, man? Send them while I'm killing for 45 minutes because that's what they're doing in the States, or at least they used to anyway. You'll hear some comedians say now nobody comes out to see shows anymore. If you like this podcast, check out part one on Surviving Life with Les Stroud, wherever you get your podcasts. I got to stay with my fun songs for an interview with Ron James. This is a silly take on the Unicorn Song by the Irish Rovers, written originally by Shel Silverstein. This adaptation, written by the late Randy Clark, is from my debut CD. This is The Cockroach. A long time ago, when the world was new, there were more kinds of insects than you could ever shoe. They infested the earth, and most are real gross. But the ugliest of all was that old cockroach. There were fat caterpillars and ladybugs, and all them things you'll find underneath your rugs. Hairy black spiders you'll be scared to approach, but they were nothing compared to that rotten cockroach. So the Lord said to Noah, he said, build me an ark. But it was nighttime and Noah said, are you crazy in the dark? So the Lord sent two fireflies to light his way. And then the Lord said to Noah, hey, Noah, by the way, get me some fat caterpillars and ladybugs. And all them things you'll find underneath your rugs. Hairy black spiders you'll be scared to approach. But by all means, just leave behind that rotten cockroach. So Noah finished up, and he said to the Lord, Lord, I don't think I'm going to like having all them bugs on board. I've been bitten, I've been stung, and I'm sore afraid that at least you could have supplied me with a can of rape for them fat caterpillars and ladybugs and all them things I'm finding underneath my rugs. Hairy black spiders are getting pretty close. I'm the only one that's not bugging me is that old cockroach. So Noah looked up at the Heavenly Father And the Lord said, throw that stupid bug in the water So Noah grabbed the roach and he gave him the boot But that silly old roach had his own scuba diving suit Oh, the Lord wasn't happy, no, but Noah couldn't carry a seat He was still stuck with all them bugs in there So the waters came up but the roach just swam away And that's why you'll see roaches all over the place And until your dying day You'll see fat caterpillars and ladybugs And you'll see lots more underneath your rugs 
Hairy black spiders you'll be scared to approach But the one you'll see the most Is that old cockroach Everybody loves the cockroach <laughs> You know what? Aggressor Adventures, while being the largest liveaboard dive operation in the world, is so much more. They have safaris and excursions to the corners of the globe, exciting opportunities to see vast archaeology, history, and natural wonders. I've been traveling and diving with them for years, and I cannot endorse them enough for being simply the best there is at making sure your worldwide adventure is a safe, comfortable, and exciting one. Take it from a guy who has done a lot of adventuring. Who do I travel with on my vacations? Aggressor Adventures. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. I started composting. There's your lease on immortality. Come see the soil, kids. Hard to believe last fall it was Uncle Henry. Look at that. <laughs> Nobody lives forever. Uh, so when you do die, don't have your loved ones leave your ashes in the jar on the mantelpiece. You have them work them into the garden. A shovel full of you, some miracle grow, a little bit of moo poo. Come October, the potatoes have your eyes. You know, I, I was I was talking to Steve Patterson, mutual friend of ours. Uh, um, uh, good man. And uh, you know, we talked a bit about. Uh, well, it's funny. He has a brand new podcast out. Uh, yeah, I did it too. With, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. of course. Oh, you did it because I got you in yes, touch, as a matter did, of fact. Yeah, it's funny, I told Steve, I said, you know, I was talking to Ronnie, I said, you know, what we should have done is Ronnie should have recommended me as a new star, and I should have recommended Ronnie. <laughs> Steve got a good kick out of did that. He, good. And he asked me to finish his sentence, right? What yeah. the, the Canadian star system is, and I don't know what you said, but here was my answer. He goes, okay, finish this sentence, Les. The Canadian star system is, and I went, fucked. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, oh, that's our promo right there. <laughs> Uh, the con you talked about the condescension it, toward stand up for me anyway. Well, I mean, toward, it's but just... toward all risky creative endeavors in in the Canadian industry, I feel. And, and hey, I'm sorry, Canada. I'm sorry, CBC Global, CTV. But you know what? In the end, the derivative nature of everything. So as I said, always looking south of the border. What are they doing down there? All of that stuff drove me nuts. And it's not that there aren't some beautiful, wonderful people. That, that some people, but the industry as a whole is beyond. Frustrating. That's a gravy train, and man. And so scared of its own self and its own shadow. And, and you said something yesterday to me. You said, man, if you're confident and you're in entertainment in Canada, oh my God, you're a pariah because you're confident. I, was, I, I get that all the time. I'm just a, and, but you know, again, it's like, yeah, you know what? For 45 years, I lived under the poverty line. Don't talk to me about confidence. You know, I had every shred of my soul and confidence just drought, ground into the dirt when I thought I was nothing for many, many years. So don't, you know, just because I feel good now, you want to bring me down because you're afraid? You're afraid to be confident because we're Canadian? You know, no, the, the, some of the greatest, Pierre Burton, I love confident Canadians. I think confident Canadians, man, I just, they inspire me. Is that what so he much. said? Is that... Is that what Pierre Burton said? No, I'm saying that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. Oh, about, yeah. About Pierre Burton. Oh, yes. You know? Yeah. He was, uh, I was a buddy. Of or or Zosky, another confident Canadian, you know? See, we're cu we're hauling up guys from the uh, from the pantheon uh, of influence yeah. for us, right? Yeah. I used to visit uh, Farley Mowat when he was yeah. in his late 80s in Port Hope. I'd visit him. He'd rat. pour me a drink of rum at uh, quarter to 11 in the morning. Do you like <laughs> London Doc? I said, yeah, Farley, I do. Him and Claire would be living there, right? It was like a little hobbiton house that filled with the accoutrements of a life fully actualized. And uh, I'm sitting down. He goes, ah, you comedy. I can. I said, thanks, Farley. He goes, but I'm going to tell you something about being funny in Canada. Uh, we, this country has a goddamn uh, dysfunctional deference to authority. I said, what do you mean? He goes, Christ almighty, Ronnie, they don't trust it. You got to sneak in the back door and be sitting down at the kitchen before the sons of bitches even know you're in the house. <laughs> I just loved it, oh, right? That's brilliant. And, and, and here's a guy now who was castigated and crucified by Saturday Night Magazine way yeah. back in the early 80s. They had a, a big Pinocchio nose on him, and I was standing in his living room, and that damn near, that near scuttled his confidence, that, you know? But Farley, you know, Farley was a great raconteur. He said, I never let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? right. And so I'm standing in his living room, and he goes, well, there you go, Ronnie. And I'm looking up, and there's 48 books, and he was 88 years old working on his 49th book. Mm. And on every book, spine that I could see, his, his the hardcovers, 
it was a different language. That's crazy. A different language. And Ian Frazier, that writer uh, who wrote for Esquire magazine and, and, uh, uh, and the New York New Yorker, uh, who wrote the quintessential book on the plains called The Great Plains, years later wrote a book called Siberia. And everybody in Siberia had Farley Mowat's book, Siberia, on their shelves. To call these uh, guys up who walk their own road in a country that it's changing. And it has changed, I've noticed anyway, with... Um, with the younger comedians who cross-pollinate disciplines now, right? I mean, you've got, in my day, there was never a cross-pollination between stand-up and improv, near the twain shall meet. But now it's, it's blended and cross-pollinated, and they're utilizing uh, so many different aspects of, uh, of their experience to bring it to the game. That's pretty exciting. That still doesn't uh, make the access to to television or to film, well, let's just talk about TV, any easier because it's so damn corporate. I think everybody is nervous about their jobs, and it's a Machiavellian minefield you have to negotiate. And once again, to get back to the road, that's what was so freeing about it, Les, was the just the joy you know, I mean, sometimes you walk into a room with network and they make you feel like you're not supposed to be there. But every single theater that we walked through gave us a warm welcome. Uh, and I have to tip, uh, I haven't mentioned him yet, but Terry McRae, my producer of the last 21 years, who took a chance on me. I'd been booking myself and I booked myself. Uh, this was way back in uh, 1998 and I'd booked myself through contact. I wanted to break away from the Laugh Resort because I knew I had to start playing Soft Seaters. And I finally got into contact. I did a 15-minute uh, showcase, and I booked myself, uh, I think it might have been 14 dates, you know, in different areas around Ontario and the Maritimes. And I booked myself into the uh, Academy Theater in Lindsay, Ontario, and it was supposed to be the Townies and the Cadillac Club. Only two people showed up from the Cadillac Club because they were having a convention there or something, and only about 60 people from town showed up and the place holds, I think, 600. So I cut the guy a deal. Six months later, Terry and his son came in. He was looking to move into stand-up because he'd been busy booking music his whole life. Everybody from John Prine to Jerry Jeff Walker. Mm. He, I think he ran a... Heroes. John, Heroes. Oh, and John God, Prine. God bless John Prine. What a loss. Unbelievable. Yeah. So he was there. And he said, I'm looking to book into stand-up. And the guy who ran the theater said, that guy's good. And it was my picture. And so it's not about the money. It's about the way you conduct business and on the conducting a business part and i think i said something you said well mike myers says the same thing and i said you know look, i'm i'm a passionate canadian i love being canadian yeah that's but if you're going to ask me to do business i'd rather do business with americans because with the american business that i've done i know they're out to screw me so i just i can see it i can read through it i i, I expect the knife in the back there so my, my i'm wearing a, a vest so that they can't stab me in the back Come up to Canada. I think I'm with my brethren and my sister, and, and we're just going to get. We're all Canadians. We're developing new stuff, and oh no, the passive aggressive and the and the smiling through their teeth. That it just it was heartbreaking to discover that that I did better business in America, and then when I'm down there kicking ass, oh now I'm I'm welcome back in Canada. Now that, now you're going to support me back here in Canada. I mean, from what I was saying earlier, like to Steve Patterson, said, you know, I've never never actually truly felt supported in Canada. Wow, I feel completely like an outsider in Canada, and one of the reasons is I'm a middle-aged white guy with confidence who came from a crappy shitty background but that's what I am but I'm sorry I can't apologize for that and yet when I deal with executives in Canada on ideas and stuff I hear such fear in the way they approach everything interesting scared of everything why are you so afraid and and in in situations where you're willing to say I don't even need much money for this I just want to let's make it happen let's make this happen and when someone goes you're right. Let's do that. I'm, I'm like, I love you now. I, I will love you forever. Cool. But, but mostly it's, well, well. And when, wow. I, you know, when you get that, it's like, oh, come on. Well, Grow you know, up. hats off to you for having the experience to strap on some kind of armor in America because you know you're going to be making money. Uh, <laughs> haven't been there. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, but who's to say, man? But again, we were, talk- we were talking about this earlier, you know, when I go down and deal with people in the United States, the, th- the reason why I- it seems to work for me is because they don't expect me. They don't see me coming. I'm not being braggadocio here what I'm s- or-, or-, or full of hubris. What I'm saying is that I just, I do, I won't dance a Hollywood dance. Uh, I just, I'm just a dumb schmuck from Canada and who teaches you how to eat a plant. But no, you know? no, uh, this is it. 
you know your product. Yeah. See, that's that's everything. You know your product. Mm-hmm. Did uh, you know yourself as a stand-up? Do you know yourself as a stand-up? Uh, I'm getting there. I'm really? Getting, eh? Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm a work in Still progress. Still a journey. Well, it has to stay a journey. I mean, do you ever say, well, no, that's it. I got it. I'm understood. That's me. It's a journey. And it's a victory in baby steps. Just like the stand-up was, I think self-awareness is, right? Hmm. And it Self-awareness. It comes with time. Tell me about self-awareness. Are you self-aware? Yeah, I mean, I think I am. And I think that the experience that I had with the special and with the loss of loss makes you self-aware. I mean, you have to, you got to change, man. I wasn't at my best the last years of my marriage. It's not a period of time I I like to reflect on, right? I think the rabbit pursuit of ambition and acquisition altered my perspective. I mean, one minute I'm in a semi-detached house. I have to run around the floors in the wintertime to hammer the nails down that are popping up because there's barely any wood on the floor and telling the girls to wear slippers in the wintertime so they don't hook their feet in a popped up nail. And eight years later, I built by my standards anyway, a, a mansion with a pool across the street and a nice, beautiful garden that I loved. And um, I was gone in 18 months and I wish I could do it over, but you can't. And then I was down in the belly of the whale for a while. I've never spoken of this, and I didn't really put it in the book. But I fell into a depression, and uh, it was hard. It was hard. I was estranged from my daughters for a while, and they needed to process everything. But what saved me, I think, was the work. And I, I literally got separated, and then 10 days later, I was creating my television series. I actually don't think enough is said for our position as uh, a person in a partnership, a marriage with children and that. And to try to get, say, the general public to understand the burning drive that's within us, in our stomach, in the form of stomach acid and all the rest, and, and ache in the heart to, to want to create, to want to, in your case, to stand up, in my case, we started this off about, uh, you know, knowing that we matter. I have been plagued, if you will, or blessed, if you will, with the intense desire to matter. Wow. I, I, I really want, I, I want to matter. And if anything, that broke up my marriage was I need to really matter. I really, uh, and I don't, it's not I want legacy. It's not that I want fame or money or bragging rights. I just want to know at the end of the day that my, the energy output that I gave mattered. It did something. That you just yeah. weren't here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I gotta take a piss. You gotta take a piss. Yeah. No, we, on this podcast, we don't take pees. Right? <laughs> well, I we got hold- a blanket on my leg sitting <laughs> in the dock, so maybe I should just go on my pants like I'm an old fella at well, the home. I wouldn't have noticed. I'll just see it dripping down on <laughs> because, the Because, you know, we're only 20 years away from wearing our Led Zeppelin onesies, wandering the home a sing-along away from taking a stairway to heaven. <laughs> a Led Zeppelin onesie. <laughs> I can check this. Which All right. A Led Zeppelin onesie. There are some things you can't unsee, even if they're just in your mind. Don't forget to check out part one of this fantastic and heartfelt chat with Canadian comedian Ron James. What you just heard was part two, and yes, there's more yet. By the way, for the sake of witnessing the camaraderie, make sure you check out the episode of Les Stroud's Wild Harvest featuring Ronnie's cameo appearance to eat some locally foraged greenery. Featured on PBS stations in the United States, as well as my YouTube channel, as well as Cottage Life TV in Canada, and around the world on National Geographic. This podcast is, as the saying used to go, brought to you by Aggressor Adventures. Choose your adventure. Surviving Life with Les Stroud is presented by the Apostrophe Podcast Network and is mixed by Keith Ullman. You're surviving life with me, Les Stroud. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud, as I have hundreds of videos there and more going up every week. From Survivor Man Archive to Bigfoot to Wild Harvesting Tips to Urban Disaster Survival. It's all there and it's all free. My brand new series, Wild Harvest, featuring local foraging and turning those wild edibles into sumptuous dishes, is now on National Geographic Asia, PBS stations in the United States, and Cottage Life Television in Canada. 
The brand new special, Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud, is now on a PBS station near you in the United States or on my YouTube channel. And my brand new children's book, Wild Outside, written for your kids. It's all about getting your kids into the out of doors. And it's out now. Google it. I'm an easy find on Google for those and so much more that I produce during any given year, no matter what's happening on the world stage. We'll figure this life out together. Cue that ripping harmonica solo, Keith. Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime.